Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is on assignment. Tonight, another stunning act of violence in France. Many, many, many policemen coming. Then we are gunshots, many gunshots. The attack, the huge security response, and the escalating tension on the street. Covert cameras in Canadian malls. That's a pretty massive collection of information and invasion of, uh, of privacy. The U.S. election is just days away. At Issue looks at what's at stake for Canada. And is your supermarket keeping things clean? I would think that they, they should have had more diligence in such an extreme time. What a marketplace investigation discovered. This is The National. France is on edge tonight and on alert. Security is tight after what French leaders are calling another terrorist attack. Now, this time, it happened in the southern city of Nice. Three people were brutally murdered inside a church. It is the third attack in the last couple of months and comes as tensions are high over caricatures printed in that country of the Prophet Muhammad. Margaret Evans brings us the chaos of the moment and the lives taken. France in the grip of another gruesome attack. Three people killed by a knife-wielding assailant at a church in Nice this morning. One victim apparently beheaded. We saw by the windows that there were many, many, many policemen coming. And uh, then we are gunshots, many gunshots. Distraught parishioners gathered at the scene. One of the victims, apparently a church warden. I'm so shocked, said this woman. I see him walking, lighting candles. Now I'm thinking he's not there anymore. The attacker was shot and injured by police, who've identified him as a 21-year-old recently arrived Tunisian man. The mayor of Nice called it an act of Islamofascism. There was no doubt what was behind the attacker's actions, he said. He didn't stop saying Allahu Akbar while he was being treated. Local Muslim leaders have strongly condemned the attack. France was already on edge, shaken by the murder two weeks ago of Samuel Paty, a teacher beheaded after showing caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad as part of a class discussion. Ce matin, nous avons décidé... Visiting the scene today, the French president Emmanuel Macron said France is under attack. He's ordered thousands more soldiers to the streets and raised the country's terrorist alert to the highest level. Macron's refusal to denounce the Muhammad cartoons have prompted outrage and protests in many parts of the Muslim world. Church bells across France rang today in honor of the victims of this latest attack. And as night fell, the city and the rest of the country were also entering another stage of strict pandemic lockdown, a reminder that Macron has more than one crisis on his hands. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Now, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau condemned the attacks in France. They were heinous criminal acts, unjustifiable by any circumstances, and an affront to all of our values. Uh, we stand uh, with everyone around the world in condemning this unacceptable violence. And in the House of Commons this afternoon, there was a moment of silence in memory of the victims. Well, there are new concerns today about privacy in this country. If you shop in malls, your data may have been collected by facial recognition cameras without you having a clue that it happened. Thomas Degla with where that was the case and why. For a couple of months in 2018, a trip to the mall may have meant being analyzed by facial recognition technology. The only hint while walking in, that blue decal warning about cameras in use. I think it would make sense maybe if they put like a sign up that said, uh, this is what's happening, just so you know. You don't give permission to, for, to these people to do any of this. When shoppers would check the mall directory, an embedded camera would take their picture, their data then analyzed to learn the customer's age and gender. The privacy watchdogs of Canada, Alberta and BC identified 12 Cadillac Fairview malls in five provinces including Toronto's Eaton Centre and the Chinook Centre in Calgary. They have to get your permission to do it, and that did not happen in this case. This all came to light after a shopper in Calgary got suspicious, seeing the words face analyzer left on screen by accident. 
Turns out there was yet another company working for Cadillac Fairview storing the numerical representations of five million faces. This suggests to people that their personal information may be captured in ways that they were never aware of and that that information can somehow end up in the hands of third parties. Everyone's biometric data is personal and experts worry it could be stolen. Cadillac Fairview stresses no faces were stored. Even if this data is anonymized, don't you think that shoppers would be surprised to know that this sort of information is being gathered about them when they're looking at a mall directory? It's fairly common now within public spaces. And I think, you know, whether you're in an office building or a shopping mall, there would have been, you know, some general expectation that that kind of behavior was uh, taking place. Cadillac Fairview says the cameras were deactivated and the technology won't be used again. Thomas Dagle, CBC News, Toronto. Now, privacy was also top of mind in Montreal today after a local health authority became the latest victim of a cyber attack. We are going through a fairly uh, rigorous process of uh, trying to get to the bottom of what we found. The authority is responsible for the Jewish General Hospital and several smaller facilities in Montreal's West End. Officials say the personal information of staff and patients wasn't accessed, but they cut all connections to the internet and outside access to their network as a precaution. Well, over the past month, CBC News has uncovered two cases of American business executives coming to Canada and having their mandatory 14-day quarantine period waived by Canadian border agents. The government called those decisions mistakes. But now a CBC News investigation has discovered a third case. Only this time, the approval came directly from a cabinet minister. And it turns out that has happened nearly 200 times. Jonathan Gatehouse explains. Canada's borders are officially closed, but still busy, as essential workers travel back and forth, exempt from quarantine. But CBC News has learned that in 191 cases, business travelers who aren't essential workers have also been allowed to skip quarantine. After getting a special exemption from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, François-Philippe Champagne, he's issued 138 in the past six weeks alone. One of those exemptions went to Nando Cesarone, the U.S. president of global shipping company, UPS. Cesarone flew into Canada for three days last week and met with employees at two locations in the Toronto area, lobbying them on a new contract. Christopher Monette is with the union that represents UPS workers. It's not immediately clear to us why the government of Canada gave Mr. Cesarone an exemption. We all need to be playing by the same set of pandemic rules here. Two UPS employees tell CBC News that at one point, Cesarone removed his mask in a crowded meeting as he spoke for nearly an hour. The company declined to discuss the purpose of Cesarone's trip, but insisted in a statement that he observed a detailed risk mitigation plan, which included masking, social distancing, testing, and other precautionary measures. Hello. Today in the House, the opposition charged there's a double standard. Question. Why is there still one set of rules for wealthy, well-connected elites and a different set for everyone else? There's not two set of rules. Exemptions have been granted after extensive consultation by Global Affairs Canada's officials. Jack Harris is the NDP foreign affairs critic. You know, we conduct parliament by through Zoom. I don't see the necessity to have some special exemption like this. After all, even with even within Canada, you know, we have I can't go to Ottawa and, 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 and come back to St. John's, Newfoundland without a 14 day exemption. According to Global Affairs, these business mobility exemptions are only handed out in exceptional circumstances where the immediate need to travel is thoroughly justified. It won't say how Cesarone's trip met that standard or who received the other 190 exemptions. Jonathan Gatehouse, CBC News, Toronto. Well, turning now to Canada's ongoing battle against COVID-19, starting with a look at the numbers tonight. 234 new cases in British Columbia, 477 in Alberta, 82 in Saskatchewan. That's a new record. Manitoba, with Canada's highest per capita infection rate, recorded 193 cases. That's also a new record. Quebec is back over 1,000 cases. Ontario also trending up with 934, which includes 420 in Toronto. Now, that's very high, but it is partly the result of a delay in processing. Still, 
Health officials are cautiously optimistic that Ontario may defy some of its worst case projections. New modeling for the province released today shows that, yes, raw numbers are still climbing, but at a slower pace than before. That's good news. But Ontario health officials also warn the situation could turn on a dime and overconfidence can be a dangerous thing. Katie Nicholson takes a closer look. One unassuming church, one big community outbreak. We thought we were safe up to last week. 30 people connected with this southwestern Ontario parish tested positive for COVID. More than 200 are now in isolation. Yet Premier Doug Ford has been hinting at a slightly more rosy future. The good news is we're, we're seeing a little bit of a decline. Well, perhaps not a decline, but more of a slow growth, at least according to an analysis from the province released today. We're estimating sort of a steady state uh, level of cases for a while of between 800 uh, to 1,200 cases. Uh, what I think is important here, though, is that although cases are continuing to grow, that uh, growth has slowed and we're starting to see a, a more gentle curve there. That gentle curve means ICUs won't buckle under the second wave. The data also reveals personal care homes continue to be a major source of outbreak. So what that means is we really should be moving to having a, an approach of testing everyone who works in a long-term care home twice a week. That's not happening right now. Positive cases remain high. Testing capacity still doesn't meet the province's own targets. And in the last week, there have been 119 new outbreaks, including a wedding in Vaughan, which resulted in 44 cases, which spread to six regions. Why then the cautious optimism from the Premier? When you don't give me the end game, any sense of positivity, that's where we get in trouble. This communications expert says, faced with bleak facts, people get overwhelmed and lose trust in politicians and public health measures. And I think that's the state we're at right now and why we're starting to see some more positivity being woven into some of the message, just to let people know, stay the course, there is a silver lining at the end. Despite some skepticism, there does seem to be a silver lining. Today's numbers suggest that this second wave could be less statistically brutal than originally thought. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Alberta now has more than 4,900 active cases of COVID-19. That is a record high. But with infections in school-age children still low, the province is loosening some of their isolation requirements to keep them from missing class. Today's changes align with similar ones made in BC, Ontario and Quebec. Starting Monday, Alberta will introduce a new symptoms checklist for kids under 18. Among the changes, a runny nose or sore throat alone will no longer require mandatory isolation. Instead, they should stay home and monitor for 24 hours. And while BC's numbers were down somewhat today, Provincial Health Officer Bonnie Henry offered a sad reminder of why COVID protocols are so crucial. This is a person in their 80s who attended a small uh, birthday party. This person um, unfortunately ended up in hospital and dying from it. Henry also pointed out that many of BC's new cases are directly linked to gatherings, a growing problem in the Lower Mainland and the Fraser Valley. Surrey in particular struggling with a new surge in cases. Well, another Mi'kmaq community in Nova Scotia has launched its own lobster fishery. They are hundreds of kilometers from the tension in the southwestern part of the province. And as Kayla Hounsel tells us, they've gotten a very different reaction, both from commercial fishermen and from fisheries officers, too. The crew of the Don's Pride says today there were no issues on St. Peter's Bay. No. Just uh, planes flying around, patrolling. But the last time that happened, we lost our gear the next day. The gear, they say, was taken by federal fisheries officers. We are, as I hear, directed to come out with skis on authorized traps. This fisherman says his traps have also been taken since his community launched a self-regulated fishery on October 1st. Well, it's stealing from me. That's how it's straight up. They're taking my stuff that belongs to me, my personal items that I use to make a livelihood. Their chief says there is a disconnect between the federal government reaffirming the Mi'kmaq treaty right to fish and fisheries officers on the ground. Just blowing my blood because I just got off the phone. I just got off the phone with the minister's office saying everything's okay. You guys won't be left alone. Next thing you know, they have their officers here, which, uh, which the minister had no idea. 
At the other end of the province, the Sebeganegadi First Nation says the DFO has not been pulling its traps for weeks now. Non-Indigenous commercial fishermen there have taken matters into their own hands, saying they're worried about lobster stocks because the Mi'kmaq are fishing out of season. The minister's office says fisheries officers take compliance measures based on numerous factors, but did not say what those factors are. Unlike in southwestern Nova Scotia, commercial fishermen here in Cape Breton have not protested or interfered with the moderate livelihood fishery. There's been no public outcry, but they say that doesn't mean they aren't concerned. This is because of the respect that we hold for the Aboriginal communities and, and again, their right to fish. It's not that we agree with the fishery that's going on because we don't. It hurts us deeply. But on the other side of it, something has to be done to cooperatively work together. These crews are done for the day, but say they'll never stop fishing, no matter how many times fisheries officers take their traps. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, St. Peter's, Nova Scotia. In Montreal, police shot and killed a black man early this morning. They had answered a call about a man in crisis and found him holding a knife. The officers at first chose to stay in the vehicle, but with the, what we're told is the man had then headed towards a second vehicle where there was a civilian. Officers then stepped out of the vehicle to intervene at which point the individual uh, apparently turned around and charged the officers, at least went towards them in, in a menacing manner. Police opened fire and the man died in hospital. This is according to the Quebec agency that investigates police. They say the man was likely in his 40s and his identity not yet confirmed. An officer was treated for shock. One of three men involved in a brazen Toronto playground shooting in 2018 was sentenced to 13 years in prison today. Taquan Robertson pleaded guilty to attempted murder and two counts of aggravated assault. In aiming to kill another man, the 25-year-old hit two kids, sisters, ages 5 and 9. Now, both have since recovered. Two others involved in the shooting are scheduled to be in court next month. And a Montreal high school teacher has been suspended after a video surfaced last week showing him repeatedly using the N-word during an online class. Students, both past and present, have since come forward with complaints about Vincent Ouellet, including allegations that he regularly made Islamophobic comments and would jokingly do Nazi salutes. The school board says it's investigating the complaints. Now let's take it to the United States. And a 33% jump in GDP reported today. It is the biggest spike in history, though it does follow the biggest ever drop. Still, it gave Donald Trump something to hold high, as both he and Joe Biden made their case to voters in a very important state. Here's Paul Hunter. If anyone needed reminding that Florida, as ever, will be a key state come election night Tuesday, consider today's dueling late campaign rallies. Joe Biden in southeast Florida. Five days left, folks. While across the state in Tampa, the president. Five days from now, we are going to win Florida. Each battling in the biggest battleground state of all, with its history of extremely close calls, and a track record of picking presidential winners, Florida is especially key right now for Donald Trump, trailing nationally and as well, though just barely, in Florida. If Trump loses that state, he may well lose the White House. If Biden loses Florida, polls suggest he could still take the presidency, but winning Florida would sure make that a lot easier. Today, on what for so many is the single biggest issue, covid a contrast in styles. Biden before a physically distanced crowd, mostly in parked cars. Trump at one of those shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder rallies, many maskless. His pledge today, he'll keep America open. We're never gonna lock down again. We locked down, we understood the disease, and now we're open for business, and that's what it is. As COVID cases now spike in this country, countless are frustrated with a pandemic that threatens lives, but also the economy. Biden countered. I've said it before. I'm not going to shut down the economy. I'm not going to shut down the country, but I'm going to shut down the virus. And he slammed Trump for staging rallies Biden called super spreaders. He's spreading more virus around the country and here in Florida today. The two will focus almost entirely on battleground states from here on in, knowing the end is near for one of them. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. 
And just a reminder, we are your home base on election night, November 3rd. Special coverage begins at 8 o'clock Eastern on CBC Television, CBC News Network, and on CBC Gem. Well, the Federal Ethics Commissioner has ended one of his investigations into former Finance Minister Bill Morneau. In a letter, Commissioner Mario Zion said he accepts the former Finance Minister's belief that he had reimbursed the WE charity for trips to Kenya and Ecuador in 2017. However, he is still investigating Morneau for possibly breaching the Conflict of Interest Act during cabinet deliberations on the WE Charity Summer Student Grants contract. Well, CBC Marketplace Investigation is looking at whether your supermarket is safe. Let's do this. Next on The National, what our hidden cameras found inside. We'd ran out of soap. As Ottawa prepares for the next U.S. president, at issue takes us behind the scenes. And a rush for winter sporting gear as Canadians prepare for a pandemic season in the snow. It has been crazy is a good word for it. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back. Grocery stores have remained an essential service throughout the pandemic, but how safe is your supermarket? Well, the team at Marketplace put that to the test with a hidden camera inside some of Canada's biggest chains, Asha Tomlinson now with what they found. Let's do this. We're going inside some of Canada's largest grocery chains to find out how safe they are. Masks are mandatory indoors in Toronto, but at this metro, we found some employees wearing their masks under their nose and chin. This staffer wasn't wearing one at all. Management are responsible for training staff on health and safety issues. Jim Chan is a former health inspector. Why uh, no manager or anyone that asked that staff member to actually put the mask back on or tell this individual that don't put the mask down. We looked through seven years of Toronto public health inspection records to see which stores have serious issues, like this Fortino's, owned by Loblaw. Records reveal a recent hand-washing infraction. Not surprising to former worker Lucas Lee. We'd ran out of soap in early May. So you couldn't wash your hands after going to the bathroom? Right. I would think that they, they should have had more diligence um, in, in such an extreme time like, like the pandemic was. When we went inside, we couldn't find any soap in the public washroom. There's no soap? Back at Metro, this store has had pest problems before. And sure enough, we saw flies in the meat department and the washroom. To me, that just being not just careless, but they're missing a good quality control program. We also tested some ready-made dishes from the deli. The cold food was over 10 degrees warmer than it should be. And that is actually an excellent incubation for bacteria. They will just grow like crazy in there. In 2017, this store was convicted and fined 460 bucks for not keeping their food cold enough. Metro says they take the issues we outlined very seriously and immediately rectified them. Loblaw says they've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in safety measures and protocols, and they apologize for the lack of soap in the washroom when we visited. Asha Tomlinson, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, we're joined now by Dr. Zane Chagla. And uh, Dr. Chagla, from what we just saw there, I mean, if you look at this strictly from a, a COVID perspective, which is the part that concerns you the most? It's interestingly the mask piece that's probably the most concerning, although those other features are probably not good for the transmission, transmission of infectious diseases. The masking is really what we're seeing in the workplace as being the thing that people are missing the most. We saw this in healthcare in the first wave. People don't wear their masks appropriately. They let their guard down with their coworkers, have lunch with them with their masks off uh, in a close confined spaces. And then you have COVID transmission amongst the staff in that sense. Mm. So, you know, that mask use really protects the grocery store employees and other employees from acquiring COVID-19 from others. And so in emphasizing the importance of masking, are you then necessarily saying that the threat from touching things, like picking up a product that someone else picked up, it's not really a threat? Yeah, in the first wave, I think we, we worried about the fomite transmission. I think the evidence that's come out, even from places where there's been a giant number of COVID patients, COVID wards and quarantine hotels, where we can't find a lot of virus on surfaces, that surface transmission is probably a very low-yield method. And hey, 
even if there is, if you wash your hands regularly, there's good evidence you wipe COVID off the surface of skin within eight seconds. So it's, it's important that you just engage in the hand hygiene. But other than that, you should be fine from a contact standpoint. Okay, so, so we've got about 15 seconds left. Bottom line, given everything that we know about how grocery stores work and how people behave in them, are they safe? They're safe if people adhere to the precautions, wear masks, distance, and do everything that they're supposed to be doing in, in uh, indoor environments. Okay, Dr. Chagla, thanks for joining us. And a footnote here, Marketplace uh, did also do a swab test to see which supermarket surfaces are the germiest. You can catch the full investigation tomorrow at 8 p.m. on CBC Television and GEM, 8.30 in Newfoundland. Well, a lot of Canadians are already getting ready to spend a pandemic winter outdoors. Like, even when it was sunny and hot here, there's people already thinking about the winter. Ahead tonight, the booming business and high demand for winter sporting gear. Next, though, Rosie's here with At Issue. Andrew, tonight we're going to talk about the Canadian political impact of the U.S. election, how the federal government is preparing for all of the outcomes, and where this leaves Canada's relationship with its closest ally. Chantal, Andrew, and Althea will join me right after this break. Canada's relationship with the U.S. has seen its challenges over the past four years, and there have been some tense political moments. Canadians were polite, were reasonable, but we also will not be pushed around. Well, he's too fast. Now, during this unprecedented time, the federal government is preparing for the possibility of even more uncertainty. We won't be commenting on uh, possible outcomes. Uh, our responsibility as a government is to prepare for uh, different eventual outcomes. Either outcome will be significant for Canada. Uh, we have spent a lot of time carefully analyzing what either outcome would mean. Okay, so what does that preparation look like and what would a Trump or Biden presidency mean for Canada? It's Thursday and I'm here with At Issue. Chantal Hebert, Andrew Coyne and Althea Raj. All right, let, let's start with what we could imagine or what we know uh, might be happening behind the scenes in terms of that preparation for those outcomes. Althea, I'll start with you on that one. Uh, well, they are uh, preparing, as the Prime Minister and uh, the Finance Minister said, for every potential outcome. The outcome that they have spent less time preparing for is the possibility that the winner is unknown for uh, a long time. Um, if that is the case, um, they are still going to start uh, lobbying efforts to new members of Congress, for example, uh, new Democrats talking about things that are important to Canada, possibly like Keystone and climate. Mm -hmm. uh, risks that they've identified, like by American provisions that um, the Biden camp has talked about. So, you know, with Biden, we actually know what to expect. With Trump, there is no platform. What they are expecting is basically more of the same, uh -huh. um, which is the possibility, like, bracing for the unknown, right? We do know that there is the question mark over the aluminum tariffs that would come about a week and a half after the election, uh, which may still come if the president decides that we have breach the self-imposed quotas that he's put on us, regardless of what the outcome is. But the relationship and the, the, prepara the preparation involved with mm -hmm. this election, uh, you, you know, uh, and is far more uh, intense than it was in 2016. There was very little preparation that Donald Trump was going to win. Let, let's talk a little bit about how the, the presidency sort of altered the state of the, the Trudeau first mandate and, and, and now into the beginning of their second. I mean, it, it, it changed the way they had to approach governing. Is that fair to say, uh, Chantal? I'm not sure about governing, but uh, for sure, renegotiating NAFTA was not on the horizon over the campaign that led to uh, the first liberal victory. And then the unpredictability, uh, which m means that the government went from the ba uh, best to the worst. Uh, best because uh, the bromance issue with, uh, with Barack Obama was real, uh, and worse because the unpredictability uh, that has been the feature of the past four years. Now, I would say that privately it's hope for the best, and the best is definitely not a Trump victory, and prepare for the worst, and the worst is not a uh, a, a, a Trump victory, it's uncertainty sure. and the possibility that uh, someone 
in the White House start saying, we want you to acknowledge that I've won before mm. it's clear that this person has won and vice versa. So it's possible to prepare in the sense of no one celebrating unless the result is clear. But I, I think it's uh, the Canadian government is bracing for if the de result is not decisive yeah. for a difficult three months. Yeah, I mean, everyone that I've spoken to, Andrew, has said that, that they will do sort of what they should do in those circumstances, and that is to keep their mouth shut. But, but Chantal's right. If there's some sort of pressure coming, a civil unrest or pressure from inside the White House, I, I, that becomes difficult. Yeah, I mean, the, the premise we have to operate under is that Donald Trump cannot contemplate uh, being ejected from the White House. He can't contemplate it psychologically uh, because it just doesn't fit with his view of himself. But more importantly, perhaps, he can't contemplate it from a legal standpoint. Uh, he's got mounting legal difficulties, criminal and otherwise, that he's been able to stave off so long as he's in the, in the Oval Office, but he would not be able to do as a private citizen. Uh, and he has simply no scruples about doing whatever he has to do to try to uh, cast the result in doubt, even a clear result, frankly. Um, so, frankly, the, 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 the idea of gridlock and uncertainty is the best case scenario in that event. Um, when you look at the fervency of his following, the fact that they believe everything he says, the fact that a good number of them are armed, there's no wonder why some of the states are now you know, talking about calling up the National Guard. Uh, so there is real prospect for, for some very tumultuous times ahead. If he does manage to beat the odds and wins the election outright or emerges from that process as the winner, then you're looking at, I mean, Althea called it more of the same, but more of the same is um, vindicating himself on his enemies, revenging himself on his enemies, uh, padding his expense account, uh, enriching himself, and causing more and more uncertainty for the rest of the world, if only yeah. because uh, he's going to be facing a Congress that will be determined to try to rein him in, just as he's determined to enjoy his last four years in power. So it's yeah. a really nightmare scenario either way. Well, and, and potentially a president who is really going to pull down the institutions that he spent a lot of time uh, eroding, and he will pull them down over the next four years. Let, let's just talk about Joe Biden a bit, because that is not a cakewalk either. Um, and and I, I think that Canadians need to be aware of that a little bit, Althea, what the challenges um, that a President Biden could bring and, and, and whether they can be overcome. What do you think, Althea? Top of the list is Keystone. Um, he said that he is opposed to the plan. Uh, Jason Kenney, the Premier of Alberta, has talked about building a sort of um, a Team Canada approach, much like what was used with NAFTA to try yeah. to uh, sell this project. Um, so that's clearly on the government's mind. Uh, maybe less, not quite as intense as NAFTA, but still uh, pretty intense. By American prisons, with, which were a challenge, frankly, under uh, President Obama as well, mm -hmm. the idea that even when it comes to climate, for example, where there is opportunity where Canadian firms might be able to compete, that we would be shut out of that. Climate is a two-edged sword. It's great because the Liberal government uh, is very simpatico with uh, a Joe Biden administration, Joe Biden administration on that issue, but also more competition might not necessarily be great for Canadian firms. He wants to re-engage in world institutions uh, like the World Health Organization, like the UN. Uh, these are all good things for Canada, the WTO. Um, so, yes, there is opportunity, but there is a lot of risk. Is there more of one than the other, do you think, Chantal? It's impossible to put uh, another four years of Trump on one side and Biden on the other and to just do this balancing act. Sure. It would be great for Keystone XL if Trump is re-elected. Uh, that involves normalizing the Trump presidency, and if anyone wants to do that after four years, count me out. <laughs> so yes, there will be hurdles, uh, but uh, normalization, that's like telling Canadians, can we go back to life before the pandemic? Uh, yes, it was full of hurdles, but it was something uh, that you could seize control on. It's called normality. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the scale of the hurdles, and there are always hurdles in a relationship, normality trumps all. So, so th all those challenges that Althea so 
well outlined there. They're Andrew. all Those, real. Yeah, they're all real, but they're all manageable, Andrew, I guess is the point. Is that right? They're the kind that we're accustomed to. Uh, right. So, yeah, I'm in the Kikwa camp, frankly, on relative <laughs> terms. Uh, there are always going to be some issues. Uh, there are under Republican or Democratic presidents, Southwood Lumber, you know, uh, and, and so on. Yeah. Um, but the you cannot put a price on having a normal human being in the White House with normal responses to, you know, the usual events that come up between countries, so that you're not having to engage in this kind of psychoanalysis of just, you know, how will he overreact this time? Will it have anything to do with any rational calculation of U.S. Uh, state interests, or will it just be because he's in a fit of peak because somebody didn't flatter him enough? So having a president, even a, a president who wasn't as simpatico in ideological terms uh, with the current government, uh, would obviously be, uh, you know, a president who was more like a normal president would, would obviously be a huge gain, uh, not only for the liberal government, but for the country as a whole. I will say also that some of uh, Biden's policies, for example, reversing the, tr the Trump tax cuts on corporations and, and, and yeah. upper income individuals mm -hmm. will take some of the competitive pressure off of Canada as well. Sure. I, I don't have long, but let me ask something a little more provocative. Do you, do you think, though, that a Trump presidency has allowed Justin Trudeau to appear differently on the world stage or has allowed him to take up a place there that maybe wouldn't have been possible uh, with a different kind of president? Just quickly from all of you, Althea. No, I don't think so. I mean, if you recall back to 2016, he was still on this like honeymoon. The world loved him. He was in Vanity Fair uh, going to Davos. You know, I, I think what happened was they got consumed with renegotiating NAFTA, and that sucked the wind out of everything. Right. And so I'm not sure that the compare and contrast really has benefited uh, the prime minister, frankly. Um, but I will say, though, that I don't think the relationship is as dysfunctional as it may appear publicly. Like, we do know that Katie Telford, the prime minister's chief of staff, is still in contact with Jared Kushner, right. the, that the prime minister called the president when he had COVID to, you know, wish him a swift recovery. Things are actually operating. You just look at the border as a yeah. perfect example that, yeah, despite the, the tweets and the drama that the president is addicted to, things actually have been functioning pretty decently. Okay, Chantal? But that's on uh, Justin Trudeau and his government, I guess, because yeah. it's certainly not on Donald Trump. Uh, uh, I agree with Althea. Uh, Canada shines when multilateralism shines, and it's been the opposite of that. Uh, Andrew? I think he's benefited domestically by, by comparison with Trump. For example, we have not done a particularly good job on uh, fighting the pandemic in this country. You can mix blame between the federal government and the provinces on that. But compared to a lot of other countries, we haven't done that well. We've done very well compared to the United States. And our tendency in this country is always to measure ourselves relative to the mm -hmm. south of the border rather than looking further afield. So having somebody so manifestly unfit for office in the White House has certainly been to the benefit of uh, Justin Trudeau in terms of people's estimation of his uh, policies and performance. Okay. Good conversation, everyone. I guess we'll talk about the outcome next week. Thank you all. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to Add Issue the Podcast for extra content wherever you get your podcasts. And I hope to see you on Sunday mornings for this thing. It's my new show, Rosemary Barton Live, and it starts Sunday, this Sunday, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern on CBC News Network, 11 on CBC Television, live streamed on GEM. So I'll see you there. Now it's back to Andrew in Toronto. I'm very excited for that. Okay, uh, we are going to stick with the U.S. election because winning the White House, just one part of the equation. It's like a knife fight in an alley in every one of these places. Next, a look at why the race for the Senate could have major implications for the next U.S. president. And later, the Saskatchewan politician who promised to deliver and delivered a lot more than an election night win. Well, whoever wins the U.S. presidency next week will have to deal with another branch of American government, the Senate. And as Katie Simpson explains, control of that body can make or break the president's agenda. A woman who's running for the Senate, currently a senator respected by everybody. The president is talking about Republican Senator Martha McSally. Fast, come on, quick. You got one minute. One minute, Martha's sake. 
They don't want to hear this, Martha. Come on, let's go. Quick, She's quick, trailing quick. in the polls to her Democratic challenger. So it came as a surprise that Donald Trump rushed her appearance at his rally yesterday, given how important her race is to the overall battle for control of the Senate. Everything is on the line. We've got to bring it home, Arizona. Republicans hold 53 of the Senate's 100 seats, and the majority leader has predicted maintaining that will be difficult. The outcome of the Senate could go either way. We have airtight races in Montana, Colorado, Arizona, uh, Iowa, North Carolina, Maine, and Georgia. Uh, it's like a knife fight in an alley in every one of these places. The Senate determines much of what a president can and can't do, since it's required to approve legislation and key appointments. When the majority doesn't want to work with the White House, it can stall and even obstruct a president's agenda. It's really going to be hard for either a re-elected President Trump or a newly elected President Biden to get much done if the Senate is in opposition. Given the animosity between Democrats and Republicans right now, expectations are low for bipartisan cooperation if there's a split between the presidency and the Senate in Tuesday's vote. Polarization is highest now in the United States since it's been in the episode of the Civil War. So these are not great times for the United States. When there is cooperation between the White House and the Senate, things can get done pretty quickly. Look no further than the Trump administration working with the Republican majority to confirm judicial appointments. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. We'll call it another symptom of the pandemic. Winter gear is flying off the shelves. Stores say they can't keep up with demand as Canadians prepare for another season of COVID-19. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, there have been more than 10,000 deaths in Canada from COVID-19. We hear from three people who lost someone close to them. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Well, with winter slowly closing in, millions of COVID-weary Canadians can't wait to get out there. Tired of being cooped up, they are more than ready to ski and hike and hit the snowmobile trail. And as Carolyn Dunn explains, business is booming for outfitters. In a pandemic, there's no business like snow business. Snowmobile sales started picking up months early and are way up at this Calgary store. You mentioned people were actually popping in in August. Yeah, and it was pretty crazy. Like, even when it was sunny and hot here, there's people already thinking about the winter. This father and son have already bought ski passes. Today, they're shopping for snowmobiles. Are you finding that there's not a lot you can do inside anyway? Definitely not. I, and after quarantine, it seems like everything you could do inside, we've done already. I mean, I think we're all on that boat right now, and uh, the socialization is obviously down. There's nothing more uh, uh, satisfying than spending a day outside. COVID has pushed dry land training for Edmonton's Nordic Cross Country Ski Club outdoors. Perhaps a good thing to have all this extra space since memberships are up around 20%. Outside transmission is, is so much better than inside, or so much lower than inside. So um, I think that's another draw, that you can actually socialize but, but be safe with it outside. The buzz about outdoor winter sports this year is so strong, Lake Louise opened today, the earliest ever in its history. No surprise, there's a run on ski equipment. People worried the trend will empty the shelves. It has been crazy, is a good word for it. Um, I think just the excitement for skiing this year, knowing that we are going to be outdoors and it's one of the things we are going to be allowed to do. In other words, take that, COVID. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Okay, next on The National, a Saskatchewan politician certainly delivered a little more than just her election campaign. Our moment is next. Saskatchewan NDP candidate Alina Young was campaigning at nine months pregnant and her slogan, ready to deliver. <laughs> As you can see here, she sure did. But her baby wasn't her only delivery. Today she won her riding, so her two reasons to celebrate. Our moment. I'm Alina Young and this fall I plan to deliver. 
election night, I was in the mother baby ward of the general hospital. So uh, this little loaf was born at 9.30 on Sunday morning. We got out of the hospital the other day and uh, yeah, my phone started blowing up. So it was, uh, it was, it's been an exciting afternoon. I have honestly been staying in the house with Taylor and Hera. I have mostly been sitting nursing my baby and uh, I did have about half of a beer for the first time. So uh, I don't want to plead baby brain, but uh, you know, 80 hours out, I might. It's something that we should celebrate is, is more women and more young women and uh, very, very young women being politically engaged and involved. It's a really, really exciting day. Gosh, that's uh, adorable. And, and I guess, you know, by virtue of the fact that we're telling you about this story, we're sort of making a big deal out of this. But in her own um, sort of impressive way, she never, uh, Alina Young, never presented this as extraordinary to us. She, she was sort of quick to remind us that, look, women have babies and they work all the time. They juggle the two things. And so whether you work in a grocery store or you're in politics, well, that's just what we do. Congratulations all the same. That's The National for this October 29th. Good night.